Welcome everyone. I'm Kat Lloyd, Vice President of Programs here at the Tenement Museum. Happy Teacher Appreciation Week and thank you so much for joining us for tonight's Tenement Talk. Um, we are here in a space that you might recognize if you've come to one of our events before. Um, we're seated in the living room of Ramonita Rivera Saez uh, and her two sons, Jose and Andy. Um, they were Puerto Rican migrants who moved to New York City in the 1950s. And uh, in this living room, we tell the story of their family um, as really part of the, the first major group of Puerto Ricans to come to New York City and transform uh, the city as we know it today. And um, while we're in a living room right now, um, another space that um, was really important to the family was the classroom, right? And tonight's conversation will really be all about what is happening in classrooms uh, past and present across the United States. Um, for Jose and Andy Velez, um, they went to PS42, it's a couple blocks down, um, still a New York City public school, and um, they go to school. Um, arrive in, in public school in New York City when they're six, seven years old. Um, and they hadn't grown up speaking English, right? They spoke Spanish. Uh, and their teachers um, didn't speak Spanish. They didn't speak English. Um, and there was no bilingual um, education uh, in the New York City school system in the 1950s. So Jose and Andy are two of um, thousands of Puerto Rican students who are experiencing um, the challenges of navigating a classroom um, where they can't understand their teacher. And although they remember picking up the language quickly and that their teachers well, were well-meaning, um, we look at this story um, and, and look then at the history of Puerto Rican parents advocating for their children's education um, as a really monumental turning point within the history of immigrant and migrant education and um, within the, the movements of, of student advocacy and parent advocacy um, that we will touch on tonight. And uh, both Jose and Andy graduate high school. Um, when we turn the cameras over to our guests, you'll get to see Jose and Andy's high school graduation portrait on the wall um, behind them. Uh, so we can imagine a big graduation celebration in this living room. Um, but the legacy continued on beyond that um, with this family's involvement in education. Uh, both Jose and Andy have uh, two daughters and um, three of the four granddaughters in this family are teachers. So um, this, this legacy is carried on within the, uh, the work of um, the Vela's grandchildren and um, we imagine Ramanita, well we know Ramanita um, was incredibly proud of them for being profesionales or professionals uh, and for um, continuing this, this work. And um, tonight's conversation um, on uh, the book Making Americans um, will look at, at stories from across the nation of um, how um, you know, immigrant students um, have fared in classrooms, um, how teachers have navigated um, arriving students, uh, and we hope to hear from you as well um, in this conversation. Uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome tonight's guests, uh, author Jessica Lander, who's also a high school teacher at Lowell High in Massachusetts, um, and Rima Amin, who's a reporter with Chalkbeat, a national nonprofit news organization covering education across the country. Um, so they will be um, having a conversation that we welcome you into. So please um, share your questions, your comments in the chat. Um, I know we probably have some teachers watching, so please share your own experiences, what you are finding in your classrooms. Um, and I hope you enjoy. Uh, don't forget as I always have to say, um, to um, you know, follow us on social media, visit our website, find out about our um, upcoming virtual events, uh, and most importantly, we want to hear from you. So um, enjoy, and thank you again for joining us. Hello. Hi. It's so nice to meet you in person. It is lovely <laughs> to meet you in person, and it's just really, really cool to be in this space. I know, and it just we actually also just realized that these portraits are behind us, which is super cool. Um, so for everyone watching, I am Rima Amin, the reporter from Chalkbeat New York, um, and this is Jessica our, Lander. Lovely Hello. guest, Jessica Lander. <laughs> and I'm a teacher at Lowell High School in Lowell, Massachusetts, and also the author of Making Americans, Stories of Historic Struggles, New Ideas, and Inspiration in Immigrant Education. Well, I want to open just by saying, I don't want to gush too much, but um, when I was asked to come kind of moderate this conversation, you know, part of this assignment was reading this book, and it turned out to be a complete joy. I, I could not put it down. 
Um, it's beautifully written. It has so much historical perspective that I had no idea that we'll get into today. Um, and I just, I, I just wanted to share that I'm so excited to be here. And it's, it's so great to meet the voice behind all of this storytelling. Thank you. I mean, it's, it, that's really, really powerful to hear. I, I think it's, I've spent three years um, traveling across the country and speaking to teachers and speaking to my own students and speaking to folks at the heart of history and trying to, to learn and then tell these stories, to share these stories. But of course, as a writer, and you know this, as a, a reporter of, you, you're trying to convey ideas, you're trying to share these stories, but you don't know how they'll be received until you send it out into the world. And so there's that, that leap of faith. Um, so it just, it's really powerful to hear that the story spoke to you. I mean, they're really, really powerful stories, but getting that, that power across um, through text can be really, really challenging. So I'm just, thank you. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and I mean, and the book, we'll get into this kind of each chapter is divided um, into, you know, history and then kind of looking at a teacher in more modern times and their approach to um, educating newcomer immigrants. And then a personal story that you've picked up from your own, you know, teaching experiences um, in Lowell. But I wanted to, um, so there's a lot of material there, but I wanted to open by letting you perhaps read a, an excerpt um, from your introduction, sure. I believe. Sure, sure. Um, happy so to do that. people can get an idea if they haven't. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so all of this started in my classroom. Um, I have, and so that's probably a good place to start. Um, and Kat mentioned, of course, that I'm a teacher, first and foremost. Um, I have the honor and the joy of teaching recent immigrant and refugee students in Lowell, Massachusetts. And I teach students from about 30 different countries who recently come to the US, from Colombia to the Democratic Republic of the Congo to Cambodia. And they do such extraordinary things in my classroom, um, the ways in which they're supporting each other, um, the ways in which they're growing and learning and taking risks, the ways in which they're supporting their families, their high school students. Um, and so many are supporting their families. Um, and they do extraordinary things in our community as well. So they, they take their learning out into the community. They write books and share it. They write op-eds. We should talk um, uh, news talk because um, they all learn how to write an op-ed. That's incredible. And that 10 of them each year get published in the local uh, Lowell Sun newspaper. Um, local newspaper. Yes, That's exactly. Great. No, That's we have so a exciting. fantastic local newspaper. So, um, and they've been really supportive of our work. Um, they, they tackle community issues they care about, from food insecurity to uh, one, one class this year is looking at recycling, another is looking at vaping um, with teenagers. And it's, it's from seeing the remarkable strengths of my students and seeing all that they brought uh, to our classroom and to our community that really made me want to go write this book because I both wanted to be a better teacher for them and also wanted us collectively to be thinking about how we can reimagine immigrant education for our students um, and wanting to try to gather some of these stories because today one in four students in the U.S. are immigrant origin, either children of immigrants or immigrants themselves. And so this is something that is important for all schools, all communities to be thinking about. Um, but it was really, it was seeing the remarkable things my students do that led me to want to write this. And so the opening of the book you asked me to read uh, opens in the classroom. Um, and I'll just read the beginning. So welcome to my classroom. You're all welcome up to Lowell if you find yourself in uh, the area of Lowell in Massachusetts. Um, but if you can't come visit, through the pages. <laughs> Can I eat with you? It was September 2015, and one of my students hovered hesitantly at the classroom's door. Gangly and shy, Wilson was apologetic. He had recently left his home in Puerto Rico, coming to live and study 1,700 miles north in Lowell, Massachusetts. Now surrounded by nearly 3,400 new peers, he felt lost. Though as a Puerto Rican, he was an American citizen by birth, he still often felt as foreign as the many immigrant peers who filled his new classes. Nowhere did he feel he belonged. I, too, was new to the community, having recently come to Lowell High School to teach immigrant and refugee teenagers. That first month, a routine was born. Each day after my fifth class, as students streamed out, Wilson would shuffle in, carrying pizza, a sandwich, or sometimes a baked potato smothered in sour cream. 
My desk became our makeshift lunch table. Little by little, I grew to know Wilson. I asked about his favorite classes, his weekend excursions, and what he missed most about the island. Then one Friday, during our lunch, he had a question for me. Pointing at my hands, he asked, how did you learn to use those? Nestled between my fingers were bamboo chopsticks. Wilson, I quickly learned, was mesmerized by all things Japanese. It was a love rooted in anime, which had spurred him to spend late nights reading Japanese history and practicing the katakana and hiragana alphabets. Over lunch, in a pause between classes, lesson planning, and grading, Wilson and I began speaking about learning languages and cultures. But our lunches did not remain one-on-one -on -one for long. Early in October, Wilson's classmate Ni, nee, a tall, serious Vietnamese girl, asked to join. Ni nee was quickly followed by Po, an inquisitive Korean refugee from Southeast Asia. More soon followed. By November, lunch in my classroom was bursting with students. Yemeni, Iraqi, and Lebanese girls drew center seats into a circle. A Liberian boy who loved history hung with a freckled Tanzanian boy near the door. In seats along the wall, a gaggle of Brazilian girls liked to linger. Two Cambodian girls sat side by side in front row desks. Students chatted, ate, hunched over unfinished homework, and peppered me with questions about history we had learned in class. Lunchtime also offered a master class in cuisines. Poe presented classmates with excruciatingly spicy, tiny fish. Ni nee unpacked Vietnamese soups and passed around her spoon. One Lebanese student brought in, brought in flaky diamonds of baklava that left everyone licking honey from their fingertips. I watched as students, tentative, curious, enthusiastic, taste seaweed, egg curries, empanadas for the first time. I watched, too, as Wilson grew less reserved and more talkative, surrounded by his classmates from around the world. Almost everyone in the United States traces their origins elsewhere. To ancestors who, whether by force or by choice, built new homes and new lives here. Some arrived 400 years ago and some four months ago. Some came seeking opportunities for themselves and for their children. Some came fleeing persecution. Many were brutally enslaved and forcibly transported across the Atlantic from the coast of West Africa. Even indigenous peoples, whose forebears had lived in America for millennia, were violently displaced from their ancestral homes. The result is a country of unrivaled diversity. America's plurality has always been a source of strength and for many, a point of pride. Our coins proclaim e pluribus unum, a motto that originally referred to the union of 13 colonies, but now speaks of the union of peoples drawn from a multitude of countries and cultures. The plaque beneath the Colossus in New York Harbor has, for more than a century, promised welcome to the globe's tired, poor, and huddled masses. And yet, that same America has long fought to turn people away from its shores, especially based on where they come from, what religion they practice, or whom they love. Claiming that new arrivals would take jobs from Americans already here, or asserting that newcomers were racially inferior, the United States has excluded them from schools and from jobs. Suspicious of their customs and skeptical of their allegiance, states have passed laws banning them from speaking languages other than English, and people have pressured them to abandon their cultural and religious heritages. Despite the tension between welcome and exclusion, the country has always relied and will continue to rely on new arrivals. They enrich America in hundreds of ways. They bring their talent, determination, and resilience to our shores. Given the importance of new, uh, newcomers to this country, a critical question for our future is, how do we ensure that immigrants feel safe, supported, and valued, with the chance to put down roots and build new futures, so that they can become full participants in their new home? In short, what does it take to make Americans? So wonderful, it's a good way to, to ground this conversation. <laughs> 
So that cut, that's a good segue into the opening of the book, which is um, actually right here in, on the Lower East Side, but more than 100 years ago. Yeah. Um, we meet Julia Richmond, who is um, the first female district superintendent. And just to quickly explain, New York City is the largest uh, public yeah. school district in the country, and it was at the time, was, and yeah. schools were separated into, um, you know, under the leadership of, of various individuals, and one of them at the time was Julia Richmond. And she, you know, you introduce her because she has this pioneering idea to provide specialized instruction for newcomer immigrants. However, this person, um, you know, Julia's aim was to kind of Americanize yeah. these new arrivals, um, which struck me, especially in a city now that's celebrated for celebrating other differences mm -hmm. and, and it, not just accepting people, but celebrating the differences that people have. So I wanted to ask you, tell me about why it was important to ground the book in, mm. in that idea. Yeah. yeah. Um, and it's just, I, I've got to say, it's really cool to be at the Tenement Museum, to be speaking about Julia Richmond and to be in the Lower East Side. And it's just, I'm also a history teacher, so like I nerd out about this. <laughs> um, so... I wanted to start our story here for a number of reasons. Um, and so, uh, Rima, as you mentioned, the book has three sets of stories, stories of the past, stories of the present, and stories of the personal. Um, and so that first story of the past is about the Lower East Side, right here where we are. Um, and Julia Richmond was really fascinating because she was the first woman uh, district superintendent, and she specifically asked to work in the Lower East Side because of the newcomer population. Um, at the time in between the 1880s to like 1914, about uh, close to 20 million newcomers came to the country. Wow. Uh, right. Wow. Yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, it's hard to wrap your mind around it's the number. It's a staggering it's number. It's a staggering number. It, yeah. um, and uh, that's double that, that um, than the amount that came in the 60 years prior. Okay. Um, and so you're seeing... Um, uh, all of these newcomers come into communities, mostly into cities at the time, and teachers trying to figure out, well, what does it mean to educate newcomers um, in a way that they weren't maybe as um, forced to think about um, beforehand um, because there might have been a few or less in their communities, but suddenly, I mean, you had classes in New York, um, in New York City of 50 to sometimes 100 kids in a classroom. You had schools turning kids away, just saying, I'm sorry, we don't have room for you. We are not gonna educate you. Um, in 1906 in New York City, I think one in six students, uh, one in every six students was a newcomer. Wow. Um, and so there was a real transformation in the population of students at this time. Um, and so wanting to start there and thinking about stories of immigrant education, this seemed like a really powerful place to start because educators were really thinking concretely about immigrant education, what it meant to educate newcomers to this country. Uh, but, but it's complicated. I mean, all this history is complicated. So Julia Richmond comes in, she seeks out and asks for the position in the Lower East Side to support newcomers because you're seeing newcomer students drop out at really large rates. Um, you're seeing really no supports for uh, learning English or learning education in the U.S., might, which might be different than in home country. And so she wants to support this community specifically. And so she comes up with one of many experiments to support different groups of students who are struggling or dropping out, one of which um, so nicknamed the steamer classes. You know, these, um, yeah, I thought uh, that, that yeah. name also was striking to me. Yeah. Right. Um, after steamer ships, after steamer that ships people that, came over on, right? Exactly. Yeah. And what, this is one of the first examples um, we have in the U.S. of uh, a program that was specifically designed for newcomers. And it was a six-month primer on English and America. Hmm. Um, and thinking about, okay, so you're new to the country, you might need additional supports or slightly different supports as you transition from schools in the home country to schools here. Um, and that's really powerful. I mean, we see the, uh, uh, the traces of what Julia Richmond started right here in the Lower East Side in a, a lot of our schools today, in English language classes today. Um, we can see the origins of that right there with Julia Richmond. So in 
That way, her work is really powerful and innovative. At the same time, it's important, too, to acknowledge uh, the, the larger movement, which you um, were talking about before, the Americanization movement. And so at this time, educators are seeing lots and lots of newcomers in their classes. And they, many of them, um, are going, OK, well, we, we want to, quote unquote, Americanize them. And they had very, very strong and very narrow opinions of what it meant to be an American. Um, and so many educators, many school systems set about trying to mold immigrant students into that very narrow lens of what they thought it meant to be an American. And for many newcomers, that meant um, forcing students uh, to abandon their religious and cultural heritages. So my, my great-grandfather, Daniel, came to uh, New York in 1906. And he and his family came to the Lower East Side. And uh, they were refugees from what is now Ukraine. And when he came as a seven-year-old, his, his language, history, culture, religion were not welcome or wanted in schools. Wow. Um, and this is part of the Americanization movement, that it was really trying to, to st strip students of what they, they came with, those strengths, not seeing them as strengths, seeing them as deficits, seeing, um, and we can look at the language of um, some educators at the time, of... Um, all the ways in which they're saying immigrants aren't bringing any strengths into the country and we have to, to give them our, our values um, to make them American. Um, and, and that's a, it's a really a hard piece of our history to look at and really important though for us to acknowledge right. um, because it, it shaped a lot of education for a long time and shaped the experience then of newcomers um, of that generation, what was lost. Yeah. Um, our language wasn't passed down. Um, our, our culture was sort of subdued and hidden. Um, and so Julia Richmond was also a part of that, of trying to rapidly Americanize students. Um, specifically, some of her work was to um, rapidly assimilate uh, incoming Jewish um, immigrants and refugees, like my family, coming in from Eastern Europe. Um, and that's a really complicated, fascinating history of why she and other educators were trying to do that. Um, but but there's, there's multiple sides of Julia Richmond. She's both really, really fascinating, doing really innovative work to support newcomers. At that time. Vision, at that time. Right, right. But also some of the ways in which she's thinking about how do we educate immigrants are really, really troubling. And I, I disagree with. Um, but I think, too... The fact that she was thinking about newcomers um, is, is powerful. And so starting there with that idea and starting, too, with this, um, this large um, increase in immigrants at the end of the 1800s, early 1900s. Well, let me ask you, so Julia Richmond's story is one of several historical perspectives that are included in this book. And I'm, I'm smiling because I there were ev every... As I mentioned earlier, each chapter of this book is broken into themes that, you know, Jessica believes after doing a lot of research and talking yeah. to educators across the country of things that schools and, and frankly society should be doing in order to properly welcome and educate newcomer immigrants. And that includes, you know, providing a sense of security, um, making them feel like they have a community, advocating on their behalf. Um, and each chapter not only has the historical perspective, like, the story of Julia, Julia Rich. Richmond, um, that it has these other elements to it. Um, but the historical part, I was so interested by the things I did not know. There was not a single historical part of any of those chapters yeah. that I was like, oh, I learned this in school. And some yeah. examples are like, and, and I apologize if people knew this, but I didn't know that um, you know, President Lyndon Johnson mm -hmm. was a teacher, that that's the first job he ever held, I assume, like yeah. a professional job. Yeah. Um, and that specifically he was teaching in these um, very segregated schools in California that were Texas. basically, or in Texas, Texas. I, I yep. apologize, in Texas that had um, basically were only enrolling Mexican-American yeah. students. Or I didn't know that before the landmark case, Brown versus Board, Board of, of Education. Education, that sought to end segregation of schools, there was this and case um, that sought to end the segregation of um, Mexican-American students. and you know, yeah. based on a uh, family that wanted their children to yeah. be able to attend school with yeah, yeah, white yeah. students. So 
I guess my point is, how much of this history did you know going into the research of this book, and, and how did it kind of make you reflect on the education you had? I, it's, um, and I, I'd love to sort of throw that back at you too, to think about like what histories you've learned after. Um, I, I'm, it, it was the same for me in terms of, uh, these were not histories that I learned in school. Um, and I'm embarrassed to say that like almost all of the history in the book was um, the history I learned while researching the book, uh, but also then really made me reflect on our education. Also the way we, we think about uh, teaching immigration. I think we, we teach um, often, not always, but often um, a, a more rosy picture of immigration. Um, uh, we, we teach the Statue of Liberty. We teach Ellis Island. And those are really powerful, important stories. And those are part of the, the larger story of immigration in the country. Um, I don't want to discredit that at all, but like I, I never learned about Angel Island um, in San Francisco, um, which if, so if you were an immigrant in Ellis Island, you on average spent anywhere between two hours to two days. If you were a hopeful immigrant uh, in Angel Island, you spent anywhere between two weeks to two years detained on Angel Island. It was really created as a detention center. Um, and it was, you had different immigrants coming in. So you had immigrants mostly primarily from Europe um, coming in through Ellis Island. And at the time when Angel Island was running, mostly from China. Um, and seeing and grappling with those, those periods, those policies, um, those programs that were either welcoming or trying to exclude um, and needing to acknowledge both of those. Um, but even too, I mean, the, the powerful cases. So like when did, Mendes v. Westminster, the Ninth Circuit case in 1947 that uh, helps lead to the desegregation of schools in California. What a, a, a powerful civil rights case. I didn't know this story. Yeah. Um, I, and so it, it has really made me think about what are the stories we're telling about immigration? What are the stories we're telling about immigrant education? Um, particularly when so many of us can trace our origins elsewhere. Ninety-eight percent of us can trace our origins elsewhere at some point, whether our families came by force or by choice. And so thinking about how we are teaching those stories of migration, um, teaching those stories of immigration, and I, I mean, I for one think that these stories need to be taught. Um, I, I try as much as possible now to teach these stories in my class. Um, so I teach U.S. history to about uh, 130 amazing immigrant and refugee students. And I try to center these stories. Um, yeah, are you, are you now centering these, the things yeah. that you've learned from this book, specifically those yes. parts of history in your class? Yes. That um, seems novel. Like, I still don't know where else that's being taught. I, I mean, there are amazing organizations that are um, creating curriculum and material around immigrant education specifically. So Reimagining Migration is a really fantastic organization that is trying to center these stories and this history of migration. Um, uh, and there are others, um, uh, but, I, but it needs to be taught more. Um, so we look at the 1924 Immigration Act. I didn't know about the quota system, and I'm embarrassed to say that and folks, many folks might know about this. I didn't. I wasn't taught about the, the 1924 Immigration Act that really closed our borders for many years. Um, and so we, we teach them. We look at the graphs, and we look at the quota system, and we... Then look at the 1965 Immigration Act that starts to open borders again, but is also a complicated law. And we, we look at Mendes v. Westminster, and I, I try to bring, there are more and more books um, that are directed to kids that are starting to tell these stories. Um, and so I to bring those into the classroom so my kids can be reading those um, as well. But it's so, so important. And I mean, I, I did not learn these stories. I'm curious um, for you of, were there stories of immigration or immigrant education that you learned either in school that stuck with you or after school, that you're like, huh, why did I not learn this before? Because like, that was me for like the whole three years of writing. Basically the same thing. I mean, I'm thinking that I did know about um, the quota laws, yeah. but I, I, I don't think I learned that in, in high school or middle school or whenever. I think I just learned that later in life and everything is mushy now, so I just yes. don't know. Um, but no, if you ask me, what did you learn in school about immigration, I would say, Statue of Liberty, Ellis Island, um, which is so funny because so m my own parents came um, to the United States from India. My dad came in the 1970s and my mom came in the 80s. And they, f they 
flew here, you know, and I just, uh, my point is like, you, you learn about Ellis Island and then there's, there's more modern American history that you learn about in immigration, but it's like, yeah, it's like, I don't even really know what the climate was of the country specifically regarding immigration, even when my own father came. Mm -hmm. Um, so nothing that really stuck. And I, I do, it actually makes me wonder reading those stories, even reading your book that if we did have some of that, more of that in our curriculum, how it would, how it would impact, you know, the various attitudes that um, policymakers and political leaders still hold about immigration, yeah. you know, on, on either end of the spectrum or in between. And, um, but, but yeah, I mean, it, it's really made me reflect on that. Um, and, and to jump around a little bit, yeah. because I, I got thinking about this, because you mentioned your yeah. students was, you tell these incredible stories of your students, um, many of whom are refugees who have mm -hmm. come from conflict. I mean, one, um, there was one Iraqi student yeah. you had, and I'm, I'm blanking Troy? on her name. Or Sophia. Sophia, yes. Yeah. And she went to school, school nearby, yeah. a gunman came in and um, opened fire and clearly had, you know, had this very traumatic thing happen. Um, and there were many students like this that, who, ha who came from pure conflict. Um, the, Robert, the child Robert. whose story you tell throughout the book, I mean, now he's an adult, but um, he, you know, lost his mom um, as part of the conflict um, where he was from the... Democratic from, Republic of the Congo. Yeah, Democratic yeah. Republic of the Congo. Um, so I kept thinking, and you talk about this in the book, but as a teacher, one of the pillars that I think you emphasized was if we want to make newcomer immigrant students feel welcome, we have to talk about their strengths. We have to recognize them and yeah. we have to recognize them as, as human beings. Yeah. But how did you kind of coax stories out of these mm -hmm. students and kind of get them to trust you enough where they would talk to you about these very, very deeply traumatic experiences? Yeah. Um. So multiple parts to that um, that I'd love to touch on. So I'll touch on that that second part first, but I want to come back to strengths. I'm going to pin it. Um, I mean, the the seven young people who shared their stories generously and courageously, um, it really is courageous sharing their stories in the book, are kids I've had the honor of knowing for many, many years. Um, and I have taught them. I mean, Chori, I taught. So Chori's another student from um, Iraq who grew up in Baghdad um, during the war. I taught him as a freshman. I taught him as a junior. I taught him as a senior. Um, Stray Nith, who is from Cambodia, I taught as a, a freshman and as a sophomore, but continued to see her throughout. Um, and so these are all students that I have had just the, the joy and the honor of watching them grow over the course of their high school um, career. And then also, you mentioned Robert being adult, right? They're all adults now. Yeah. And so seeing them become adults and become just such powerful advocates in our community, um, and it, it makes me smile. And it, uh, it, uh, the small and big things they do in our community just, ah, uh, it is powerful to watch. Um, and they're, it's, it's such a joy to know them. Um, so for them, when I was thinking about the structure of this book and what sorts of stories I wanted to include, I knew that there needed to be stories of young people. Then if we were serious about reimagining immigrant education, we needed to learn from the past these stories of history that we, many of us do not know, the two of us <laughs> didn't know. Right, yes. uh, we need to learn from the present, innovative schools today, what's working. Um, but we, we also really, and for me, I'm a teacher, this is the heart of the work, is we need to learn from our young people. We need to hear their stories. We need to understand their experiences of coming to this country and their experiences of our schools if we want to rethink about how we think about school to best support them. They're the experts here. Um, and so I knew I needed to tell or hopefully tell stories of young people to include their voices. Um, so when I was setting out to write the book in 2019, actually, I took a year off from teaching to begin research and writing. And Thank then, goodness for that. <laughs> yeah, and then came back and was full-time writing and researching and editing and full-time teaching. And during a pandemic, it was a lot. Oh, okay, well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, when I was first setting out, I, I reached out to these seven students who um, I had seen 
grow throughout their years of high school. Many of them were then right at transitioning into college. And I asked them, um, and it was very much, a, would you let me share these stories? Um, and you can totally say no. Um, and at and some point before that, they, they, while you were teaching them, they had trusted yeah. you enough to, to tell, tell parts, parts of their stories. Okay, parts. Yeah. But maybe not as deep as you not get as to deep. for the book. Right. Okay. No, so that's a really good point, and I can come back to that. So for the book, reaching out to them and going, can, can I share parts of the stories? And then that was sitting down with them for multi-hour conversations. I mean, I think I, we had about 20 hours of conversations with each student. Wow. Um, yeah, just a wide ranging and free flowing and then synthesizing and thinking about all that they had shared and then trying to craft part of their story and then really, really importantly, giving them what I'd written and making sure that they were comfortable with and their families were comfortable with what was being shared. Um, that was really, really essential. They were giving this gift of sharing part of their story so we could learn from them. Right. It was essential that they were sharing what they wanted to share. Um, to your question of many of them had shared parts of their stories beforehand. Um, and in my class, I, I try to create opportunities for students to share stories. Um, I, I like to think about it as like opening doors but not requiring anyone to walk through those doors, of um, knowing that not everyone is ready to share parts of their stories of migration or wants to, and that's totally okay. Yeah. But also, recognizing that some students do want to and might need that invitation. And so trying both in my curriculum in creating opportunities for students to share stories and also just in the in-between spaces of being there if students want to talk. Um, being like, like the scene in where you're like, having lunch. Exactly, with Wilson, yeah. which is, I was reading and I was like, oh my gosh, it's Wilson and he's from Puerto Rico and we are in this room that was um, uh, lived in by a Puerto Rican family. I was just like, this is really, really it's cool. All it's yeah. all connecting. Um, right, so exactly that. Places like lunch with Wilson and learning about Wilson through those lunch conversations. and. Those take time and they take trust. Um, it's like most students, there are a few students, but most students are not gonna just like share everything on day one. Um, I've had a few. <laughs> but trying to build a, uh, a classroom culture, and that is not just me, that is all of us creating that space together, where students hopefully feel, um, I'm never gonna wanna speak for a student, but my hope is that they feel that they can come and talk if they want to or need to. Um, and then also, too, we mean we, we publish a cookbook at the beginning of the year um, where students choose a favorite family recipe. And they have to go home to mom or grandpa. They have to call someone overseas and get that uh, recipe and translate and then write a story about that recipe and a little bit of their migration journey. Um, we publish that cookbook and share it in the community. Oh, wow. And so creating small ways to again, open doors if students want to share parts of their migration story. Um, and of course, for the seven students here, it was, it was much bigger, but I did know some about each of my students um, before asking them. Though at the same time too, I mean, there was so much I didn't know um, and so much that was really powerful to learn and thinking about the ways that could have impacted my teaching if I had known that about their experience of learning in our school when I was still teaching them, um, it would have been powerful. And so thinking about how I take what they taught me and try to create more opportunities to learn from my students while they're still in the classroom so I can adjust and support better um, while they're still my students. I, I want to pick up that idea you talked about um, with, like school, with specific school programs. I'm yeah. very interested in this. And you are probably familiar with um, the Internationals Network, which yep. is a which is one of the schools is part of the International Network in the book. Um, oh, wait, which one is that? Is it The International School at Langley Park um, in oh, Maryland. Oh, that's right. It's part yes. of the network. Yes. That's right. Okay, so this, I mean, this school model is... Interesting. You know, it is very interesting. It's exclusive yeah. for new... Exclusively serves newcomer immigrant students. Um, and there were several sort of related programs. There's the refugee school, the school for... Refugee uh, girls. Female refugees yep. in Georgia um, that are sp specifically for these students. Yeah. But I heard something a few years ago from just, um, you know, this 
fellow journalist I know who herself is an immigrant. And when she heard about these schools, she thought, well, it's a nice idea, but isn't, isn't that basically segregation? Don't you want these students to be interacting with their other peers? And um, I'm just going to pose that yeah. question to you. No, Do you hear that? And, and, and I just want to, just to unpack that a little bit more, these schools have wraparound supports yeah. often. They're offering intensive extra supports to um, these, these newcomer students. Mm -hmm. um, and then here in New York, well, some of the schools don't require um, these kind of high school exit exams that we have, right. which kind of eases the burden, I think, on yeah. them, especially if they're arriving later, um, later in high school. But anyway, to no, pose the question to you. Uh, no, it's a great question. Um, and I do hear about that. And I think it's a, a constant debate that I'm hearing in the space of, do you create separate smaller programs for newcomer students? Um, is that a form of segregation? Um, and I, I think the, the answer that I have seen, at least, um, in traveling across the country and visiting schools is that it's complicated. Um, that there isn't a, a, a one, I know, I know. Um, so I, I think it can be done great in both ways, and it can be done poorly in both ways. Um, so I'll give you two examples. Um, you mentioned the school in Georgia. So the Global Village Project um, is a, the only school in the United States for refugee girls who spent a long time out of school. If you are, say, a 16-year-old girl and you come to the U.S., you don't know that much English, you've perhaps never had a chance at formal, that formal academic schooling. In most communities in the U.S., you're going to be placed in 10th or 11th grade. Good luck. And so what the Global Village Project does is recognizes that that's not going to work. Um, that's not a successful strategy if you maybe need to start at a kindergarten level of education. But at the same time, you're a 16-year-old girl, and you've likely shouldered the responsibility of adults for many, many years. Right. And so we have to honor both of those parts of your identity. We can't treat you like a kindergartner, um, but we also can't just throw you into the academics in the 11th grader. And so what I think is really powerful about the Global Village Project is that it's created this really small, intensive wraparound community for this particular group of students. And it brings in 100 volunteers from the community to support and work with students one-on-one. -on -one. And it has a curriculum that's really nimble and um, student-specific, and it can be because it's a very small school so that as students master content, they can move up, whereas typically you'd like go through 11th grade and then you'd go through 12th grade. No, you could like jump grades as you're mastering content, and many of them are because they're older, they're able to right. with that support. And so they go through this program, this school, for two to three years, and then they're ready to go into high school and are much more likely to succeed. So that seems like a really phenomenal model of creating a special space that is just for these young women um, to support them in a way that many high schoolers around the country are, are not set up to do. Right. Um, I've also seen it work really well in um, schools that have newcomers and students whose families have been here for generations. Um, and so thinking about, say, Leah Jolke in North Dakota and the ways in which she is supporting um, her newcomer student, she teaches immigrant and refugee students um, in Fargo, North Dakota, and she has both newcomer classes, but it's, it's a, just a big high school with all sorts of kiddos, and she also does really interesting, um, she's created a class called the Partnership Class, where she has, it's called Old Dakotans and New Dakotans, mm -hmm. and trying to build bridges between students, because I think one of the so one of the challenges of segregating students is you're separating them, right. um, and so you can say, as some will, that a, a place like um, the the international schools is separating students from uh, mainstream, multi generational American families. Um, but you can also say, I mean, just putting newcomers in a, a big school doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to feel that sense of belonging and are going to get that support. And I, I heard that from so many students and also so many teachers I talked to who were um, themselves when they were students newcomers of, I was one of the only newcomers in the class and I never spoke and I did not have friends. Or I sat in the back of the class and the teacher never talked to me. 
Um, I think there was the, a teacher in the book who yeah, literally who had that experience. Literally had that experience. Yeah. And so that is it's a really powerful negative experience of othering. Um, and so it, it's, yes, they're in the same building, um, but they might not feel that they are part of the community right. um, and might even feel more excluded um, because that there's that weird sense of if you're in a space but you don't feel connected, it can amplify the level of exclusion. Right. So all that's to say I think it's complicated and I think there yeah. are really great examples of it working where we have students from all different backgrounds, newcomers and students many generations in the country and also can work in these places like the Global Village Project or the International School at Langley Park in Maryland or there are other international yeah. schools. Because I mean you, so the, the school in Maryland which is an in, international school so it's all newcomers because it's all newcomers, that also means that newcomers are in all the positions of power. So they're the heads of the sports teams. They are leading student council. They're leading debate team. And in many schools, we, and Carlos Beato, who's the um, founding, direct, uh, founding um, principal of um, IHSLP, the school in Langley Park, talks about this of like in many schools you don't see newcomers in those positions of power in school um, they're not going to be the captains and the the heads and the presidents of the student body and so here you see students leading in all these ways right and that's really powerful too yeah. it can go both ways yeah well i think um we have maybe some audience questions or questions on youtube that cool we might want to We have, we have someone in the audience. <laughs> well, thank you guys so much. This was so interesting. I've learned so much, and thank you. Um, are there resources or forums for teachers who want to educate themselves and help their students and do whatever they can to make them feel as welcome as possible? That is a phenomenal question. Thank you. Um, I think I'll, so absolutely. There are some really powerful organizations and resources. I mean, the Tenement Museum has a really powerful education department and really powerful resources to think about immigration history, particularly on the Lower East Side. Um, uh, Reimagining Migration is an organization that I mentioned. But I think at a, a broader level, um, teaching is often so isolating um, that we are often not connected with each other. I mean, I have so few opportunities to learn from my colleagues down the hall, let alone colleagues uh, in other communities, let alone across the country. And so I think there needs to be more opportunities to learn from each other, particularly for thinking about how we reimagine immigrant education. Um, that was really one of the impetuses for writing this book, um, of trying to, to bring those stories to educators and also others, because it's not just educators. This is um, work that should be done by educators, reporters, um, people in um, the nonprofit space, people in politics, people in the community. Um, and so how do we connect folks more? How do we create more opportunities to learn? I think one thing that I found really powerful um, is I would be at one school and they're doing really interesting work, but then they're like, we're struggling with, say, family engagement. Um, and I'd be like, well, I was just at Enlace in Massachusetts, and they're doing really powerful work in family engagement. Can I connect the two of you? Um, so rather than each community struggling on their own, there are really extraordinary resources in the expertise of educators and young people and organizations in communities. They just might not be known. In the case of Enlace, that's a school that's 15 minutes away from me. I did not know about them. Thinking about like history I didn't know. Yeah. There's a lot I didn't know. I didn't know about this school. It's 15 minutes away from me. Um, and so I think thinking about there are so many, so many um, innovative creative programs out there that we need to identify. We need to do more of that. There are great organizations though too. Reimagining Migration, the Tenement Museum, there's so many others. I hope too that this book can be a resource. <laughs> I'll just throw that out there. Um, but I think we need more ways to connect and collaborate as well. It's a great question. Are there other questions? Yeah. Or we can just keep talking. I, mean, yeah. I want to ask you questions. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, this is Kat again from the museum. Um, I am just curious actually to hear from both of you a little bit about how you are thinking about um, the folks who are most recently arriving um, to New York City um, and perhaps also to, to Lowell, right? And how you see some of these historic ideas um, sort of playing out um, within classrooms right now. Yeah. Well, so can I turn that to you? Because I just, and, and then I'm also sure. happy to jump in, but I mean, I, I've been reading a lot of your work and I'm just, it's, I know how exhilarating it was for me to be able to go into schools and see things and be like, ooh, that's a really interesting idea. And so I'm, I'm wondering from your work and your reporting of what are some of the ideas that you're seeing that you're really excited about in supporting immigrant students. Um, and it could be like big policy or even just small practices in the classroom too. Yeah, so um, it's a great question. And to connect it to what Kat was asking, yeah. we're in this moment right now. I mean, right. this is extremely timely because yeah. this week is the end of Title 42, which is a federal immigration regulation. And essentially due to it, um, cities like New York are expecting many more asylum seeking families yeah. to come in and make New York City their home and um, thousands of such families from Central and South American countries and I, I hear from teachers also people from Ukraine um, mm -hmm. and Russia as well have um, made New York City their home over the past many months um, and about 14,000 children have enrolled in public schools and so I don't want to overuse this word um, but but many people view it as a crisis moment. Um, I think there's a lot of teachers who are not equipped, um, are not trained on mm -hmm. how to properly serve newer immigrant um, students. And, and yeah. does this, you know, you no. as a teacher, you probably know, you know, yeah. what, what that might feel like, or you've heard of that challenge. Um, so I think um, there's a lot of questions about do schools need even more funding um, than they have already received an extra funding for this um, so that's a huge question but I think um, you know when you think about opportunities something that I've heard over and over again from various school communities and I've seen like my other colleagues in the press report on too um, is these parent or like PTA mm. schools are banding together it, almost every teacher I talk to about this will tell me what's going on in the classroom and be like oh but also the PTA is um, gathering donations of mm. coats mm. and books mm. and canned foods and and there's also this there's the food insecurity crisis is is also a big issue right now mm. with the end of extra SNAP benefits and so um, all of these things coming together have galvanized communities and families. And while mm -hmm. it is a moment of crisis, it is very um, interesting to see mm -hmm. how these school communities are banding together um, to assist families in any way that they can. And I think also to Kat's question, as I was reading the book, I just I feel like the the um, negative sentiments about newcomer immigrants, the yeah. the um, uh, efforts that teachers will go to to make sure that students feel welcome. Um, honestly, everything I read, I feel like, could be applied to maybe how you would want to approach this. Um, but also, it got me thinking. Yeah. We're also in a moment where funding is mm -hmm. is not a given. We don't have as many COVID stimulus dollars, and so how do schools grapple with that? Yeah. And I, um, it's a question I can't answer yet. I, I don't know. I. We're watching it. We're going to see what school districts are doing. Um, but yeah, I hope that kind of answered the yeah. question. No, no, sure. it's really... But yeah, um, yeah, I'm curious to hear your answer to both yeah. of those things. Um, I mean, I, I think your point on communities, it was reminding me, so there's a school I talk about, or five schools I talk about in the book um, in Colorado, the Action Zone, yeah. that is tapping into the strengths of their community. and. Bring, really using a community model that we can see, again, thinking about the history, tie back to the Settlement House movement and Whole House in Chicago and Jane Addams um, more than 100 years earlier. Um, and we have Settlement Houses right here in New York City yeah. as well to this community school model that's tapping the strengths of the whole community. It's not just for schools to be supporting um, and educating and nurturing students. It's the whole community coming together and um, bringing together the local hospital and the nonprofits and the businesses and families, um, particularly immigrant families, um, to be collaborators. I, 
I think it's it's really like one of the reasons I wrote this book is really because like this is a one in four students are immigrant origins. So one in four students are immigrants of the children of immigrants. And we're seeing communities right now, um, as you're saying, seeing um, and welcoming in um, large numbers of newcomers. And so this is something that we need to be thinking intentionally about. And I, um, funding is, of course, really, really important. And people should fund schools and fund programs working with immigrants. But I think, too, how should we think about what immigrant education should look like. Um, we've seen it look very differently throughout the last 150 years. I think sometimes um, there is a, a focus specifically on language acquisition. Um, and language acquisition is really important for thinking about English language acquisition. Um, but, but that's not everything. Um, when I'm thinking about supporting um, and educating my immigrant origin students, I'm thinking about all the other ways I'm supporting them as children and as young adults. Um, and first and foremost, I, I believe that schools should be nurturing that strong sense of belonging for young people who are coming to this country and they're creating new homes and new lives here. And we want them to feel that sense of belonging here if they want to make this their home because then they'll be best set up for success and they'll be bringing all their strengths and talents to our community. And so. How, how can we think about the, the programs and the practices and the policies from the curriculum we teach and the histories we teach to the, the policies in our schools that either make our kids feel welcome or excluded um, to the ways we are creating or hopefully creating opportunities for them to succeed, for their voices to be valued? Um, how are we thinking about the whole child in that? And my, when I was researching the book, it, um, really it came down to belonging from all those folks I was talking to, and educators, young people, folks of the heart of history, it comes down to belonging. And you mentioned uh, some of them near the beginning of our conversation. I, I've pulled from these eight elements of belonging. And you were mentioning a few, from community to, to security and the need for advocates um, to recognizing students' strengths. How, I, my hope is, how are we thinking about those elements in thinking about how we're best supporting students now. And that can look like so many different ways, but I hope that can be a guiding framework. Um, I think it's also a really important time for us to be advocating for more funding and advocating for more collaboration with organizations. Um, and I agree with you too, there, there's, we have a moment right now with the cuts of funding from the pandemic um, with the influx of uh, newcomers to particular communities right now, just given global trends, um, that this is a, a place of possible challenge, but also then the, the flip side of that is uh, opportunity. Right. Um, and our students bring so many strengths and their families bring so many strengths to communities. So how do we invest in them? Right. Um, I wonder, um, okay, I, do we have room for one more question or are we... Yeah, I think we're good. Yeah, I think I think we're good to sign off and leave it at. I mean, we could keep going on that. We will keep going <laughs> offline. Like so. so yes. <laughs> but we're, thank you again all so much for joining us tonight, and thank you especially to Jessica and Rima for the conversation. Absolutely, this thank was so you great. So much. This thank was really you. so much fun. Thank you to the Tenement Museum. We really appreciate it.